Hello, welcome to the Data Color 2013 webinar series. I'm David Toby. I'm Global Product Technology Manager at Data Color. I'm uh, doing the global part of my role this week, and I'm uh, attending this webinar from Zurich in Switzerland. So I'm not going to be doing much of the speaking. I'm not sure that the bandwidth on this connection will support that. So I'm going to very quickly hand you over to David Saffer, who's going to be um, speaking at this webinar today. And I'm actually looking forward to hearing this one myself. So if you have any questions, be sure to set up your GoToWebinar control panel and open up the question section. If you type in the question section, then I will diligently answer you from another time zone here. And I think that I can probably manage to, um, to do typing on this bandwidth. Now, there will be uh, some. Uh, prizes and, and discounts, at least discounts, at the end of this webinar. I'm not up on everything that's happening, so I'll let David handle that at the end. But um, I'm hoping that um, we'll have uh, good attendance despite, oh, things like Apple's uh, uh, iPhone announcement also occurring today. That's the second time they've done that to us, but at least we don't have a direct overlap this time. So um, today's talk is Selective Color Editing and Adjustment, and the idea is to learn some new techniques for using um, these tools in ways that Adobe won't necessarily tell you to use them, and uh, unique things that you can do with color editing and adjustment. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to my partner in crime, David Saffer, photographer from uh, Southern California who does fine art uh, photography, commercial photography art printmaking, various other things, and uh, I'll let him continue. So thank you, David, for, for speaking tonight, or this morning, or whatever time it is where you are, and um, I'll look forward to hearing this webinar. Well, thanks, David, and it is night where David is. He's in Switzerland. He didn't. I don't know if he mentioned that. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. We're going to be talking about selective color editing and adjustment, and as David pointed out, this is a, a topic which is may seem a little bit narrow and, and limited in its utility, but as a matter of fact, I use this take these techniques all the time, particularly in my fine art and landscape work, and even in some of my commercial work, uh, to bring colors forward or to send objects back in the photograph, in other words, push them back in terms of their importance. Um, this image on the front page has uh, quite a bit of that work done to it. It's not an HDR. Uh, it's a picture of an old house in the attached buildings that was taken in the Palouse, which is in, in Washington State in the United States. So moving forward, I'm going to go to the next slide. Well, that's interesting. There we go. Um, we're going to talk about color adjustment at the, at the global level uh, in a sense that we're going to select a particular color. And we're going to talk about how one might affect that throughout the photograph. We're going to talk about selective color adjustments, in other words, selecting a particular color in, uh, in one place, and even a very tightly focused local adjustment, or even a color change. I, I want to point something out on the left here, which I, I had meant to start out with. That's a color wheel, very stylized, um, kind of fancy. But it does give you an idea of, um, first of all, uh, which colors oppose each other on the color wheel. So for example, red and cyan are opposite on the color wheel. And green and magenta are opposite on the color wheel. And so if you have too much green in a photograph, if you add magenta, you will counterbalance the green. And the same thing goes for red and cyan, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll get into that more in a minute. Um, examples of what you can do is you can enhance or subdue colors. You can increase the accuracy of the color. Uh, you can change dimensionality. In other words, an image that looks very flat with very similar tonal values and different objects in the image can actually be made to look much more three-dimensional. And you can change the perceived position, in other words, from front to back or vice versa. Now, Photoshop is one of the better tools. Um, it's got quite a range of tools, as a matter of fact. We're going to talk about a number of them. And there are plugins that are useful. And I actually am going to spend a little bit of time on Nick Vivesa. 
just to give you an idea of what else can be done in terms of local or selective color adjustment. Um, but do remember the color wheel. The color wheel, the basic principles of the color wheel can help govern what you do in terms of making adjustments. And what I'm trying to do is expose you to some of the possibilities here. It's not that I feel that I can, oh, how do I put this, indoctrinate you to the extent that you can leave the webinar and go and do this instantly and get a perfect result. Uh, instead, what I'm doing is exposing you to a number of possibilities. Uh, some of these tools can be used in more than one way. And once you've been exposed to the possibilities, then grab a few of the images that you have and practice on them, and practice doing it more than one way. And I think that you'll find that over time that you'll become proficient in it and you'll get good results. Now, I'm going to take a sip of water here real quick. I want to talk about the tools. One of the things what we did not mention at the beginning of this because we were having some audio problems is ISO is a co-sponsor of this webinar and we thank them for their support um, and encouragement. Um, ISO makes fabulous monitors. I'm not just saying that. I use one quite often. I find that um, particularly on the higher end of the, of the product range that it's unbeatable when it comes to color accuracy and the nuance of color and midtone transitions, dynamic range, shadow, highlight detail, all of those. Uh, it's really quite a fantastic device. But it's not any good to you unless it's calibrated. And display calibration is something that um, I'm very adamant about. It can't be done by eye. You need a device like the Spider 4 Elite or the Spider 4 Pro to calibrate the uh, the display because they're not calibrated at, at, the, at the factory. In fact, um, most, most computers are shipped uh, set up in terms of color for word processing and email, which means that they have a very blue cast to them and they're very, very bright. Or they're set up for watching movies or, or, or you know, other content. And so to get them under control, for example, to get the highlight and shadow details, uh, to get highlights and shadows balanced, to get color to actually be accurate, that reds are reds and greens are greens. I know it sounds like a serial commercial, but it's true. Um, you really have to have a device and you have to go through that 10 minute uh, iter you know, exercise and get the display under control. Once it's under control, it takes five minutes a month to recalibrate it. And if it's under control, you're editing to the correct colors, you're not going to get an unexpected result you're going to get what you want from your big investment in this equipment. Now, typically the, the display calibration device is placed on, on the monitor like this, and it shows a series of color patches one after another. And you can see by this diagram that those color patches, which may be not very accurate, maybe not quite the right contrast, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be transformed and adjusted and transformed into accurate color, accurate density, accurate highlight and shadow detail. In fact, one of the things that um, people come to me about quite a bit in terms of color management, I'm going to get off this subject in a second, so bear with me, is they come and they say, well, my prints, the colors don't match my screen. The screen to print match is a problem. And I say, well, which colors are off? And they say, you don't understand. The, the print doesn't match my screen. The colors are off. And I go, what colors are the problem? And they go, the prints are too dark. And immediately I realize that the screen is too bright. It's not that the colors are off, per se. It's that the screen is too bright. And the screens are always shipped too bright. You've got to get the screen brightness down so that the highlights in particular are going to show you some detail and, going to, and not going to blow out. And that the shadows are going to be accurate in the representation of what's in the image. So getting the dynamic range is just as important as the color. Now, this is a close-up picture of a gasoline pump in a, in, a, in a gas station on Route 66 over in Arizona. And we're going to start off by talking about making some global adjustments. And um, this is not an adjusted photograph. This is just the beginning. We're going to use the channel mixer, and we're going to change the influence of a particular channel. Uh, and that will affect the look of the entire photograph. So you can see here that 
the output channel, which is the one that's going to be affected, is going to be red, and that's at 100%. The others are set at zero. These are plus or minus, plus to the right, minus to the left. Okay, and I put the histogram on the screen because I want you to be able to see what happens when we make a change, and I sure hope I got this right. Aha, I did. So if I, if I increase the blues, okay, remember your cover wheel. I'm sorry. If I push the blues over to the right with the red channel enabled, you can see that it pushes the blues back down here in the histogram. I misspoke on the earlier slide. It pushes the blues back. Well, what happens when you push the blues back? Look at the histogram right up above. The yellows become more prominent. Look at the balance here, blue and yellow. Think of that color wheel. And all of a sudden now we have a really warm photograph. This is a really quick way to warm up a photograph and give it that golden hour look. Now that's a selective color adjustment in my opinion um, because we've taken a certain group of colors and we've shifted them and, cre and in a creative way made the image look really completely different. If, we go, if, we, uh, if you think about how cool the last one looked, this is really quite, the different, uh, quite a different appearance. Now you can even replace the color in a photograph. This is in the same location. Uh, this is a very, very nice Corvette. By the way, it runs perfectly. It leaks a little oil, but it runs great. Uh, they drive it every day from the garage out to the front and then back again. <laughs> um, and what we're using here is a tool called Replace Color. Now, Replace Color, um, very interestingly, will allow you to replace colors in small areas or large areas, and you can tweak a color so that it becomes something slightly different or you can change it completely. And I'm going to go to the next slide and show you just how different this can be. Now I did that with about four mouse clicks. And here's how it works. You use the replace color panel. Excuse me one second please. You use the replace color panel and you turn off localized color clusters which is for a different purpose. And you use the first eyedropper to set the color group. You can see I did that here. The car was red and I went right to the center of the, the hood and I clicked on it. Okay, And then from there you go to the second eyedropper which is the add color areas. And I didn't quite finish this because I wanted to show you what happens if you don't quite get everything. Um, I went and I clicked around other areas on the car and there's some reflected color from the surrounding area that you can see in it, but I got the entire thing selected. And you can see here in this little panel that everything that's white is the, is the color area that's selected. That's what the red arrow is pointing to. Now there's three adjustments down here. I simply took the hue adjustment, which allows us to change the actual color, okay, and I moved that over until we got this really horrible yellow-green color just to give you an idea of what, how bad things could get <laughs> if they get out of control. Now I'll add a little tip is that if you do this for the whole image, sometimes you will pick up areas that you don't want to pick up. So what I did first before I opened up the replace color panel is I took the lasso tool and I did a very rough selection all the way around the object that I wanted to work on. In some images this is possible. And what that does is it isolates it to some extent and gives you more control over the actual change that takes place. But you can change the color of a sweater. Uh, you can change the color of a tree. You can do all kinds of things. This is one of my favorite tools. I wanted to give you an idea of how it operated on sort of a gross level. And later on, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can use this to um, replace or adjust a number of colors uh, that exist in an image and really change the entire appearance of the photograph. Now I want to point out that uh, I use this selection technique a lot. You can see these dotted lines. These would be marching ants if this was live. I use this technique quite a bit. I use either the lasso tool or the polygonal lasso tool. A little tip for you which I'm not going to show you on screen is if you're doing one of these lasso uh, exercises, 
zoom in to 200% or even 400%, and you'll get a much better view and place the, the, the line or the dotted lines just inside, in other words, just a couple of pixels inside the edge of the area that you want to select. If you do it on the very edge of it, you're going to find that it'll probably pick up a little bit of uh, material outside the place you want it to be. If you come inside a couple of pixels, in other words, inside this line into this area, you'll be better off. Okay, so you can make color change um, in much the same way that you can make with um, the replace color uh, tool by first making a selection. In other words, the replace color tool will make a selection for you. In this case, I use the lasso tool to make a selection of this area and then I use the hue slider to move that over to change the color of the selected area. And there's the red arrow pointing to the, um, the target and another red arrow pointing to the hue slider. Now keep in mind this is very, very sensitive. It doesn't take much movement to get a dramatic change. Sometimes you want to make a small adjustment um, and uh, you may find yourself wanting to go back and forth a little bit and it takes a little bit of practice and patience. Now you can also select a color range. And this is a way where, for example, if you didn't want to use the lasso tool, but you did want to select a particular color range, and in this case I selected the red that's on the edges of this old, uh, this old pump, because it was painted red at one time, and now it's kind of a combination of, of rusted metal and uh, pigment. But in any event, um, you would enable localized color clusters. And I usually set the range to 100%. And this fuzziness um, slider is like a lot of things in Adobe, uh, not exactly named as I would like to see it named. I'd like to see it say sensitivity. Because really what that does is it's changing the sensitivity of the selection that you're making. So how much of this actually is selected is in many cases determined by this fuzziness slider, the sensitivity slider. And as before, one would start off with the plain eyedropper, get right to the center of the area that you want selected, click on it. Part of the, part of the representation of the image in this box will turn white, switch to the plus eyedropper, and continue to click on it. Uh, eventually, you will find that areas that are outside the desired one are going to show up here. You can press Command Z and back up one time and get out of almost anything in a panel in Photoshop, and this is one of them. And you can also use the fuzziness or the sensitivity slider to change the extent to which the selection has been made. And you can see here that it even picked up the red on the pump in the background. See where my cursor is? So it can be a very accurate tool, and it actually takes much less time than using the lasso tool. It just depends on how good the contrast line is between the desired area for selection and the areas around it. If they're close in tonal value or they're close in color, then you may have problems. This is the kind of thing you know that everybody says in Photoshop, well, there's 20 different ways to do things in Photoshop, and this is definitely one of those situations where um, there are different ways to do things in Photoshop, and it does pay to try one, and if that doesn't work, to go and try a second one, or even combine them and to get to the point that uh, you need to get to. Now, there's another tool called the Color Balance Tool, which allows you to make selective color adjustments. Now, the Color Balance Tool can be used, and you can see, here's the points for the color wheel, right? Yellow versus blue magenta versus green, and cyan versus red. These are opposites on the color wheel. So if I add more cyan, it's going to diminish the perception of red. Uh, magenta counterbalances green, and yellow counterbalances blue, and vice versa. If this image was too yellow, let's say it was the, the, the golden hour, it was close to sunset, and I wanted to balance that off, I would push this over towards blue a little bit. 
Now, if most of that yellow color was being seen in the white or the highlight areas, I would come down here to the tone balance, which is really tonal range. Okay, another misnomer. I'd pick highlights, and then I would move the blue slider. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll pick the highlights, and I'll make an adjustment to the highlight areas, then I'll take the midtones, make an adjustment there, and sometimes even make the shadows. And so you can make almost an infinite combination of adjustments with this tool. It's very, very helpful if you have a color cast uh, in, a, in, a, in an image, a global color cast. It's very helpful if you want to simply adjust a particular area. So I did make a lasso around this part of the red pump. You can see the arrow pointing to it. And I pushed a little bit of cyan out there in the midtones just to show you the difference in color between the left side and the right side. So you can see that this, it can be um, really quite subtle. It's not creating any digital artifacts or stair-stepping or any of that. Um, it gives you a really nice level of control. Uh, I could work the highlights up here by simply switching to the highlights. So the color balance panel is one of those that's very, very useful and one that I do use fairly frequently. Now, the first color balance panel that you saw was one that did not involve a um, uh, making an adjustment layer. This panel is, does the same thing, but it uh, is for an adjustment layer, so it looks a little bit different. Okay, your drop down here for midtones, highlights, and shadows. Here it is, right here. But you have the same sliders, same controls. And this is a picture that was taken in Zion. Um, this is a picture, I think, of what's called the Patriarchs, and uh, it's got a lot of, um, how do I put this, it's definitely got a color cast to it. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to give you a demo uh, very quickly of how you can make that change and what kind of um, adjustment that might involve in the image. So you can see here that if I push the blues over, quite a bit of difference in the appearance of the mountains. Also in the clouds, the clouds don't look nearly as yellow. So there was definitely some yellow coming. It was, it was actually early in the day, uh, very early in the day, not long after sunrise. You'd never know it because of the cloud cover. Very cold, snowing intermittently. Uh, and yet because of the sunrise, things were quite warm temporarily uh, in terms of color temperature. So you can also see that the way the detail is rendered, particularly in the rock face here, changed quite a bit. Um, and you have to be careful with that, is that this involves a fair degree of sensitivity. Uh, in some images, it's going to a, a small movement here, just plus 13, made quite a bit of difference in the, in the actual appearance of the image. Now you can also make selective color adjustments. You can adjust certain colors in the image. Um, this is a panel, again, that can be done as an adjustment layer. Uh, in this case, I've picked the reds. OK, and then I move the cyans over. It's a balance to the reds. And you can see, again, that we've got quite a change in the way the rock face looks. Um, I don't particularly like this look. I did this because it's a dramatic change and it gives you an idea of what can happen. But that selective color uh, area is very sensitive. Um, this drop down contains a number of choices, uh, even including um, whites and blacks. So you can really get into that and change quite a few things in the photograph without ever having to reach for the lasso tool. Now, what I'm, I want to do here is show you an image that um, this is taken out near the, uh, the Antelope uh, Valley Poppy Preserve. It's over to the north and west of the actual preserve. Um, it's on, down a dirt road out behind it. For those of you in California, this is a, a place well worth exploring. And it's a very cold, windy day. Uh, so the poppies weren't doing it. They were all um, hiding. And so we went around this side. And you can see off in the distance there are some poppies and some yellow areas. And what you can do with replace color 
is you can go into different parts of an image. You can select different color color areas. You can see that the tall values of all this area in here and even some of this area in here aren't that different, and it makes the image look very flat, very, very flat. And although it's pleasing landscape, it could be a lot better. So what I do with something like this is I'll go into the image and I'll try and select just a particular part or colored area. And I'm going to try and bring it up in terms of brightness so this, is, this becomes uh, more prominent, uh, more appealing. And I'm going to mix that effect in a number of ways. And you can even change the color, the selective color. You have a, a couple of choices here. You can move these sliders back and forth, or if you click on this square, it gives you the color picker, and you can move that color around. This is another way to change color sometimes, but it's some, frequently not quite as effective. But if you move this circle back and forth, you can change the rendered color. Now, one of the... Um, drawbacks to this is it doesn't give you a live preview. So you have to guess at what you're going to get. Fortunately, it's nice and big, so you have a, a decent idea of what the color is going to be. It does show you before and after, but it doesn't give you a live preview down here. Okay, so here's a, another example. I wanted this area, you can see where it's white, to stand out some more. So you can see the difference. Here's what it looked like before. Okay. And going forward, I brightened this up just a little bit. I selected this area out in the mid-range here. And so now things are starting to brighten up in the image without killing some of the shadows and the other things that I'm seeing over here. I'm making a very localized, gentle adjustment. Um, one of the advantages to using the Replace Color tool is that when you make selections, it feathers them for you. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it, it gives a very, very pleasing transition so that even if I zoomed into 100%, you wouldn't see the edge of this transition here. And here's the final result. I worked on this for probably an hour. Uh, I changed some of the colors over to green. They were a little bit brown. Um, I changed the yellow in the background to make it very bright. You can see some of the poppies here in the background. And what was a nice, uh, pleasing image, I think, is, is greatly improved. Now, let's talk a little bit about plugins. Plugins are, um, you know, you can almost say a dime a dozen, but I'm a big fan of the Viveza. Uh, tool set. In fact, I'm looking at this, it says Vivesa 2, and I think there's a Vivesa 3 now. Uh, I'm going to have to check on that, make sure that uh, I change the slide if, if, that, if that's the case. But what these do is they cr create what's called control points, and you can control just about everything about an area in an image with a control point. So one would click here, and then come over here and click in the middle of, say, this particular group of leaves, and it creates a control point. And that control point has several handles on it, if you will. I went forward a slide. We have handles here for the size of this. So if I pull on this particular slider, it's going to affect the area that's, um, it's going to change the area that's affected. If I pull on this one, it's going to be contrast. There's one for saturation and another one for structure, which is, in a way, it's micro-contrast or micro-sharpening. It's kind of hard to figure out uh, exactly how one describes that, but it does, um, it does uh, have some aspects of the clarity slider in Photoshop along with some aspects of uh, micro-sharpening, so it's a little bit hard to describe. But in any event, going back, you can change the area that's affected by this, and there's some real voodoo in behind it that I like very much, is that wherever the center of this is located, the software is going to pick up on that, and it's going to say, I'm in the middle of a field of yellow leaves, so the only thing I'm going to change is going to be yellow leaves. And it's not going to change things that are, that are in there that don't fit that description. So you can very closely limit both by the size of the external circle 
and by the fact that the way the software operates is exactly you're going to very closely control the area that you're going to um, be working on. So it's, you can place multiple control points. You can place control points, for example, all around this and have a different effect. You can place control points in other corners of this image. And in fact, I used Vesa quite a bit on this image. Um, this area back here where the cursor is was formerly um, too bright and a bit blown out. I put a control point here and then brought the brightness down and voila, I got a lot of the details and the leaves uh, came back. So that was very helpful. This area over here was too dark. I brightened that up and increased the color saturation in the greens. So you've got a really nice tool here for, um, for very tightly controlled uh, so, you know, color, color adjustment, color saturation, uh, color accuracy, whatever you want. Now, there's another aspect to this which is really interesting. Just take a look at this picture. You can see here in the red area that all those leaves got changed to green. Remember we talked before about replace color. Well, there's what it was before, and there's how it is now. And what one does is places the control point, and you can take this eyedropper, and anywhere you click, it's going to replace the colors that were selected here with the color that you clicked on with the eyedropper. Now, I'm not saying that's a superior way to do it. Each one has its merits. It depends on the texture in the area that you're going to be working on. It depends on tonal differences and how much detail there is in the area. And so one may work better on a particular image than another. You have to experiment a little bit and go back and forth sometimes. And once you get some experience with it, I think then you'll find that the uh, that the images get better and better, and you'll be less tentative about trying one versus another. So a quick review, and then we're going to talk about um, a number of sample images. Um, like I told you before, this is a re relatively focused, almost a narrow subject, so we're going to finish in less than an hour for sure. Um, I want to remind you before we get into some reviewing some of these images that there's a good range of tools. Um, there are sort of tools for good or evil um, in the sense that you can overdo it or underdo it and you know get an unexpected result. And it, it really does pay to practice quite a bit and to try different things. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, you may be able to make changes that your printer can't quite handle. Um, I would encourage you to go to the data color uh, website we have a screen to print match webinar that we recorded which talks a lot about managing color changes and um, saturated colors and getting not only a good screen to print match but making sure that while you're editing that the color that you're producing on screen can actually be reproduced by your printer. So I suggest that you go and take a look at that. It's, it's a pretty good webinar in my opinion. Um, you can combine tools, mix and match, and experiment, and there's plenty of images, and including the ones that I'm going to be showing you, where you can use one tool and then switch to another one for another part of the image, and then switch to a third one for another part of the image. And in taking small steps, those additive effects can be very significant. You want to make sure that they don't get so significant that the image starts to look unrealistic, which is sometimes not so hard to do. Um, you want to use these things to enhance tonal separation and, and increase dimensionality. In fact, I'm going to back up for a moment. The dimensionality of this image is one of the things that I was shooting for when I was doing a lot of the editing. You can really see the, the rolling nature of the hills much more so than you could before. Um, you can see the differences in the foliage. There's so many changes that I made in this that it was well worth the effort. Um, it's gone, like I said, from being uh, something of an average landscape to something that's at, at least improved. Um, the dimensionality part of it is, uh, is something that I'll show you uh, as we get more into some of the demo images. Now, this is an image that I also took in the Palouse, and it's in the morning. It's direct sunlight, and a couple of things happened here that, that were um, 
I wouldn't say disturbing, but disappointing. Because of the bright direct light, which there was nothing I could do about it, and because I was working with a group at the time, we were running a workshop there, it wasn't going to be possible for me to come back later that day. And so a lot of the color in this yellow grill, for example, was just not quite what you see here. So what I did was is I lassoed this very carefully right around the edge and into the shadow just a little bit and down and across here. And then I used the Replace Color tool. And I, if you remember that palette, um, I brought up the Replace Color tool and I, I clicked in several places in here until um, I made sure that it understood which color I wanted to replace. And then I picked a more saturated, brighter yellow. Now, sometimes on, on different screens, that yellow is going to look a little bit green. Um, but I promise you that in the final print that the green uh, is gone and the yellow is, is very prominent. It makes for a, a really a, a, you know, a standout presentation. I did the same thing for the fender here that was in the direct sun. <clears throat> it was a little bit faded, uh, not quite as saturated as I would have liked it to have been, and I used the Replace Color tool. One of the nice things about the Replace Color tool is that it will bypass these green areas and not affect them at all. It's only looking for things where the pixel values are red or reddish. And so you get a very realistic effect. You can't tell, really, that I did anything to it um, by looking at the surrounding uh, elements of the green grass, the, the blades of the grass. So uh, I think this one I would count as a success. And this was a car in the same field, and we really had the same problem in the sense that direct sun um, fading out some of the really, really nice colors. And again, I used the replace color tool. And I didn't really need to make a lasso this time because it, it's, it's pretty well isolated, this blue area. And that's what I was really looking for. And it, was, it looked more, it wasn't quite sky blue, but it was several shades lighter than this. And what I did was, of course, was use the multiple eyedroppers. And I went from place to place and got these selected. And then I brought the saturation up and the lightness down. And what that did was is it showed you some of the weathering. You can see the very graceful curves and how the paint is weathered here. It also brought the colors up so you have a kind of an, a, a nice differentiation with the teal color here and a little bit of green and blue here and then this really nice dark blue towards the front of the car. And this is one of my all-time favorite images. And again, you can see that the grass was unaffected even though that part of this area got selected. The grass is unaffected. The grass is unaffected here. It, it leaves alone the things that you want left alone, and it addresses the things that you, you want to change. And so from an artistic standpoint, it really gives you an opportunity to dial that image in and really get what you want out of it. Uh, same thing here. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this photograph um, is that it's surrounded by, by wheat fields. And so in the, the, the original image of this, all of the clabberts here, all the white areas, and even the colors on the ground and everything had a slight green color cast to it because the sun is bouncing, which you can't see off to the left here. The sun is bouncing off this enormous field of very, very green wheat. It's about, uh, I don't know, knee high at that time. You can see a little bit of grass over here, but it looks nothing like this. It's really, really dense and, and very, very bright color. And what I did was is I put a spider cube, and David will appreciate this. I put a spider cube on top of the truck, and I used the spider cube to color balance the photograph before I proceeded. And so that got rid of a lot of the green color cast that was in here. Um, then I went back, and I used the Replace Color tool to give a really nice boost to the orange on this truck. And that's pretty much what the eye saw. Again, we're in direct sunlight, so it really needed some help. And the same thing for the green truck back here is I wanted to get a differentiation of the color green that we're seeing here with the green that's behind it, because they really looked very similar. Um, 
and from an artistic standpoint, I wanted the truck to really separate well um, from the green that's showing through the window and the green that's showing over here and also look a little bit more weathered. So what I did was I dropped the saturation down in this area. The pump and the facade here uh, where the saturation, uh, you know, you would never know it, of course, but I increased the saturation there. And then I came back up to the roof here and I actually did a lasso selection. And um, uh, I not only changed the, the color a little bit uh, to make it a little bit more faded, uh, I also, uh, excuse me, I changed, uh, what did I do? I did a slight curves adjustment, excuse me for hesitating there. I did a slight curves adjustment to give me a little bit more detail in the shingles. Now, the next image, this is an image that was taken in Yosemite Park. Um, we were driving along a road, and we went over a concrete bridge, and I looked over the side down into the water, and I saw this, this scene, and I went, oh my goodness, stop the car. And we climbed down underneath the bridge, the most unlikely place for a great landscape. And um, we took photographs for about an hour. Now, you have to keep in mind that, that uh, this was very, very early in the morning. It was, it was uh, right after dawn. We're in a canyon, so it's very tightly, you know, very tightly enclosed. And there's, a lot, there's not really no direct light coming in, so it's in the shade. And so this was a very, very flat, flatly lit scene. Um, everything sort of looked like it was the same distance from the camera. And I spent a, a fair amount of time making selective adjustments to this. Uh, in some areas, what I would do is I would make a lasso selection, and I would use a curves adjustment to bring the luminance of a particular area up, which would bring it forward in the photograph. And then in the shadow areas, I would lasso those and push them back a little bit. Um, but I think one of the most important things for the purposes of this discussion is that in areas like this, these colors were there, but they didn't stand out enough to, to really be compelling. And so what I did was I used a number of the tools that were in the toolbox, uh, among them replace color, but um, also some other ones. And I brought the color saturation and the brightness up so that they would come forward and be more noticeable. It was fall and really wanted to show some of the fall colors and the mix of colors that exist in an environment like this. So we have some of these orange colors over on the left and of course this area over here tended much more towards green than yellow and so what I used over here uh, um, was partly the replace color tool and partly the curves tool to bring the brightness up. And then in the background, there's some other smaller areas that I worked on. And in the end, this is a, a you know, from front to back, and, and I've probably got, again, an hour to an hour and a half in this image. You've got a really strong sense, my goals were to get a really strong sense of dimensionality, to get a really strong sense of the season, what time of year it was, uh, to give a sense of um, how quiet and peaceful it was. Um, just for the sake of the people who are, are more technically oriented, the, the effect in this water, this was shot probably at about f20 on a medium format camera, and it's probably just under a one second exposure. Uh, there was a little bit of wind, so I was forced to wait uh, frequently in between exposures so that the leaves wouldn't be moving around, but eventually we did get the shot. Um, but the point is, uh, more importantly, is that you can use light and shadow to bring things forward and back. You can see I used the burn tool in this back corner to push that back. This bright part is brought forward. Use light and dark to bring things forward, bring them back, and increase dimensionality, but also use color to increase dimensionality and a sense of being there. So, and it takes a bit of experimentation to know which tool to use and how much to use it, but in the end, I think the results are worth the effort. Now, we have a whole library of webinars, as I was pointing out before, at spider.datacolor.com. 
Uh, we have previously recorded topics. Um, we have uh, things on focus control, remote triggering. Um, we do a, a couple of webinars on end-to-end -end color management screen to print match, architectural photography. There's a lot of material in there. And of course, there's materials on color management and using the data color tools and technology. We have webinars coming up. Uh, we have one that uh, is, is going to be um, co-sponsored by uh, METS and the MAC group called Small Lighting for Big Spaces. Uh, we have another one coming up, uh, planning backcountry photo shoots. Uh, at the beginning of November, I'm going to be going up to, again to Zion National Park. We're going to be going up the river to an area called the Subway, if you've ever heard of that. It's uh, physically demanding um, and absolutely spectacular. I'm really looking forward to it. And we're also going to do a webinar on small scale and macro photography. So I hope you're looking forward to those, and I hope that you will join us. We will announce the final dates very soon on the website, so please join us there. So let's see. I've got um, a few things to talk about in terms of discounts and rebates. But first, I'd like to thank ISO and Datacolor for sponsoring this and very generous and uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to provide this information and I really hope that it's helpful to you. Um, these are specialized techniques but they're very, very useful and once you get into uh, working with some of them on your fine art photography, I think that you'll find that the results will be pleasing. The discounts and rebates this time around, 20% off of all spider products purchased at datacolor.com. They're valid from uh, September 10th to September 17th, and the promo code is MONITOR20. They're valid only in the U.S. Um, now, I'm going to switch here, and I'm going to, okay, the winner of the Spider 4 Pro is Clyde Wallen. Clyde, congratulations. Patty will be getting in touch with you to, um, get your contact information and to send that off to you. Again, my name is David Saffer. My partner's name is David Toby. Uh, we both have blogs and websites uh, with content that I think you will find very useful. Uh, generally in August, July and August in the summertime, it's sort of vacation time and, and at least my blog uh, it goes a little bit dormant. It's going to be picking up again soon. There's going to be a, a number of things that are going to start appearing on there. I also have a website at davidsaffer.com. And an important point is that for my students, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, if you have a question that you think of after the webinar, please do send me an email. I sometimes miss emails because I get a lot of them. If you don't get an answer from me within 24 hours, do send it again. Don't be afraid to bug me. I'll do my best to give you a good answer. Um, David's blog is cdtoby.wordpress.com and his website is cdtoby.com. Um, we thank you for your time and attention. We hope you'll come back and join us again soon. Um, have a great day, and uh, later on, I guess we'll find out what Apple's going to do next. So long, everybody.